Early review code for God of War Ragnarok was provided by PlayStation. Also, now the game is out, this piece gets a fair bit more specific than my review, so bear that in mind. In my pre-release review of God of War Ragnarok, due to spoilers, I had to dance around the idea that there was a feature related to combat this time around that represented a far more cohesive marriage between narrative and mechanics than anything in the first game. Well, now the game is actually out, I can finally talk about it. And I repeat, if you want to be totally surprised by this fact, go and play the game for a bit first. See, fairly early on, there is a moment when, in the character's hastiness to act against his dad's comparatively measured consideration, Atreus sneaks out alone. And as the game's one-shot camera tracks around to the same over-the-shoulder perspective previously reserved for Kratos, you realise that you're now going to get to play as the boy that Kratos has been fighting so hard to protect. And believe it or not, I think this shift in control represents the best move that Ragnarok has made between games. Surprising me, not just from a gameplay perspective, but directly affecting, elevating the narrative, emphasising its themes beyond what would have been possible were you just to control Kratos. And the reason this is all such a surprise is, well, it goes against any and all preconceived notions you might have about playing as the quote-unquote sidekick in a video game. You know exactly the kind of segments I mean here, where the game's primary action judders to a halt and you're forced into some mechanically barebones mini-game of sorts that plays to none of the strengths of the game you're actually there for and oftentimes functions as little more than a glorified cutscene, no matter how central that character is to the larger plot. And in Atreus's case, this kind of lurching suspicion should be greatly exacerbated by the fact that in amongst the wealth of unwieldy skill trees and numbers you'll get bogged down in during your time with Ragnarok, Atreus has his own separate upgrade list for you to wade through. A feature that was present in the first game, certainly, but takes on a new level of significance now that it's distinct from the combat experience of Kratos, now that you're actually pulling these moves off yourself. As with, say, The Last of Us Part 2, this feature alone lets you know off the bat that you'd better strap in because this isn't some fleeting moment in the game's story. You'll switch back and forth, but broadly, you're in this for the long haul. In short, the odds are stacked against Ragnarok. But the thing is, over time, as I built up my new playable protagonist, I started to notice a kind of shift whenever the game would revert control back to Kratos whether he was with his son or not. After a while, I kind of began to wish I could just keep playing as Atreus. Because the thing is, Atreus isn't just a lowly sidekick here. In fact, in terms of how he feels to play, he kind of rules. Sure, at first it might not make a whole lot of sense that the bow Atreus is forced to utilise as a makeshift club can pack just as much of a punch as his dad's axe, but you can't argue with what's in front of your eyes, in your hands, as Atreus proceeds to pound his enemies into the dirt, following a barrage of juggles and magic, his comparatively diminutive frame allowing him to slide, to bob and weave with an agility that makes a welcome change from Kratos's still satisfying but less finessed, more brutish approach to dismantling his foes. Atreus even has access to a ranged option that isn't hampered by the need to call the projectile back into his hand before he can use it again. He can just fire a bunch off in quick succession before seamlessly transitioning back to whatever bow-smashing rampage he was just on. Some of these enemy encounters, with the balletic combat that ensues, ended up as some of my favourites across the entire game, maintaining every bit of Kratos' ferocity but adding a gratifying speed and flow to movement and attacks here. Hell, even the aforementioned upgrade menu makes sense in this context. Its relatively streamlined nature not only makes a welcome change from the mess of upgradable fluff that constitutes the RPG side of Kratos' sections, but crucially, and this is where we get into the narrative implications of this perspective shift, it legitimises Atreus. He hits just as hard as his dad, he's faster at short range, more readily equipped at long, his encounters with the varied characters he fights alongside and the magic he can use resulting in just as explosive a tableau as Kratos's. Hell, if not more so. What all of this in totality is showing us, very directly through gameplay, is that Atreus is no longer just the kid tagging along. He is his own person, developing separately from his father. 
Even the prolonged, comparatively plodding sequences of walking and talking that you've had to endure as Kratos and that Atreus is not spared become thematically distinct when you're playing as Kratos' son. Playing these sections aids in selling Atreus as the teenager he still is, doing what all teenagers do to varying extents. He's sneaking out when his dad isn't looking to get up to mischief. He's dreaming of girls he subsequently gets awkward around. He's growing up, he's acting out, and you're doing the acting. And just like his hormonal teenage outbursts have much higher stakes here in this game than they normally would, given the prophecy all of this is leading towards, these more light-hearted moments of adolescence take on a level of subtle humour when you realise just who the girl he's being awkward with actually is, which to the game's credit, it trusts you to go and figure out yourself. Importantly though, this is all stuff that can only happen while Atreus is away from the still judgmental, worried gaze of his dad, and can only have the impact it does because we inhabit Atreus as prominently as we do. We get time to experience the quiet moments of self-reflection and mundane adolescent experience just as we disrupt said Cam with an elegantly delivered bow smash to the cranium. Atreus developing into his own person, us developing him into that person, concretely mirrors his character's flailing desire to escape the often overbearing shadow of his dad, who himself is making a much more earnest attempt to protect his son from the evils of the world and the prophecy that seemingly will ultimately befall it. Mindful, fearful of the fact that in holding him too close, Kratos risks driving his son away. Further though, the game begins to ask the question, is it really Atreus that needs his dad's protection here, as in the first game, or is it now the other way around? Hell, when you're playing all of this yourself, when you're experiencing firsthand the similarity in strength but the difference in agility between the two, that's a question that takes on a great deal of legitimacy. You start to get the feeling that Atreus may actually be more accomplished than his dad in some areas, the new generation outpacing the old and all of that, throwing your preconceived notions of what the roles are here, built up over dozens of hours of play, completely out the window. One of Atreus' biggest desires is for people to trust him. He knows what he's doing, he can fix everything if he's just given enough breathing room. And because we've felt what Atreus is capable of, it's a leeway you perhaps start to believe he should be given. Everything will be okay if Atreus can just handle it, if you can control it through him. But despite all of Atreus' very apparent strengths, we see this thought process crumble at almost every turn. Indeed, it's hard in these sections to feel like something isn't deliberately missing here. That while Atreus might be his own incredibly proficient person, perhaps like his dad, he still has a whole lot to learn that merely controlling this character can't teach him. As much as Atreus lashes out, he still needs his dad. We control him, we know he's adept in combat, but no matter how hard we try, we as players can't steer him away from being susceptible to manipulation by a dude who seems to be a caring surrogate father figure, but who actually just knows what buttons to push to get what he wants, a tactic that Kratos can see right through. Atreus is far from dumb, he's incredibly self-aware when he wants to be, but he's still just young. He needs that slight guidance from his dad through life's less simple scenarios. And Kratos, for all of his brute strength, needs Atreus just as much. Not really to keep his son out of trouble in combat, but to remind Kratos that there is still something worth protecting in this world that has taken so much from him. As long as Atreus is safe, there exists definitive proof that Kratos is more than his past mistakes, that people can change and grow in the face of a mythology so fervent in its belief to the the contrary. Through gameplay, we see that the two might function well enough on their own, a testament to how robust the game's mechanical core is for sure, but they are fundamentally lost without each other. In the control we're given over Atreus, we inevitably see Kratos losing control over the situation, over his son, giving us not just a fuller mechanical picture of Atreus' character, of his capabilities, but providing those glimpses into a sidelined Kratos as well, as both characters struggle to achieve an equilibrium of sorts to reflect the very clear love and respect they now have for one another. 
As I said in my wider review of Ragnarok, I never felt like 2018's game managed to effectively weave together its narrative and combat mechanics, each standing in stark contrast to the other. Now though, that just isn't the case. Through playing as Atreus, this struggle, this fight for balance, to navigate through the pair's now more nuanced, complicated relationship based on compassion and mutual respect, but importantly still not free of dysfunction, is a struggle that's placed directly in your hands, showing that even in the most cinematic of games, a well-considered, well-contextualized series of interactions like Atreus's can sell you on a video game story in a way that dialogue alone rarely could. Thanks to PlayStation for the early review code and thank you so much for watching. As always, these videos are made possible by the support of my wonderful patrons whose names you're seeing on screen now. They've also been getting access to exclusive videos I've been producing, fully produced scripted videos that feel like a better fit on a smaller platform like Patreon. If you want to help the channel continue and see more content, as well as entirely ad-free uploads, just head to patreon.com slash writing on games and pledge only what you feel comfortable with. I am forever thankful for your support in whatever form it takes. Special thanks go to Artyom Vitz Charles J. Liu, Alistair Dunn, Vitautis Catarsis, Matthew Bowman, Ben Pace, David Carstens, Young Condor, Mike G, Tom Webster, Max Cohen, Danis Sikowskis, Christopher Faraty, Nicholas Villeneuve, Ruth Natman, Matthew Grover, Yogesh Sishbande, Leah Cinello, Captain Knusprich, Bryce Snyder, Lucas, David Bjork, Winter, Timothy Jones, Urban Cheese, Tommy Carver Chaplin, Dr. Motorcycle, CPJ MLT Limited, Lynn Browning, Fila Nermi, Cameron Siniseros, Dallas Keen, Charlie Kimball, Jordan Midler, and Charlie Yang. And with that, this has been another episode of Right on games. Thank you all so much for watching, stay safe, and I will see you all next time.